In what remains of our wild heritage, there is no more telling symbol of the untamed than the salmon. The Romans called this fish Salmo, the leaper, and its spectacular behavior has always been an inspiration to artists and poets, as well as a challenge to fishermen. The life history of the Atlantic salmon embodies many of the qualities we most admire, beauty, power, grace and endurance. These fish, moving relentlessly upstream to spawn, are coming to the end of an astonishing journey, which started when they migrated down these same rivers as juveniles and made their way from fresh water far out to sea. Since then, they've traveled thousands of miles and for at least a year, before returning to the river of their origin to breed and usually to die. of the Atlantic salmon in the world today, 98% of them are not wild at all. They're captives, living their brief lives confined in cages like these in Loch Hu on the west coast of Scotland. This is aquaculture, the intensive cultivation of aquatic species that's become the world's fastest growing food sector. Nowadays, most salmon, instead of making epic journeys, swim in never-ending circles towards their unavoidable destiny on our dinner tables. To meet this growing market, the number of salmon farms in Scotland alone has risen from zero three decades ago to more than 300, providing jobs and investment in remote areas like this where both are badly needed. That's the plus side. But is there a downside too? Do wild salmon have simply parasites from salmon farms and never return to their rivers to breed? With 1% coming back, which is very, very poor, we'd have expected seven or so fish. We've had nothing. We're certainly looking at an extinction scenario. And when millions of farm salmon escape into the wild, is it merely an unfortunate accident? Absolute irresponsibility to have these swimming in the wild. Fish farmers could not care less about the environment around them. It's all the almighty dollar. For health reasons, we're encouraged to eat oily fish like farm salmon, but does it contain contaminants posing risks if we eat too much of it? There is a possibility of, of, of damage to the unborn child, uh, and obviously, uh, because of that, uh, a vulnerable section of the population has to be pregnant women and women that are or intend to nurse uh, their children. The industrial farming of salmon has made a luxury food cheap and plentiful. But what's the price in real terms for us and for the environment? Willie McIntosh is a commercial net fisherman on the west coast of Scotland. In the past, there were hundreds like him, sharing a large annual harvest of wild salmon and sea trout. Not any longer. Now Willie is on his own, the last netsman on the coast. Our nets come to an end. There was dozens of netting stations in those days. The fishing then was very good. We maybe got a few hundred fish a day. It made it quite profitable. But uh, it was going down from hundreds, it's down to nothing now. Commercial fishermen like Willie McIntosh were always disliked by sport fishermen who blamed them for their poor catches. But now, on the nearby river Lockie, the anglers must look for other scapegoats. Jim Semple has fished this river for 20 years. This place should be alive with fish at this time of the year. So something must be terribly wrong. Here we have the most magnificent stretch of water. And I haven't had a single fish look at me. <laughs> Indeed, I've only seen about two fish rising in this vast area. In Scotland and elsewhere, wild salmon declined and salmon farms proliferated. And as it grew, aquaculture was soon dominated by a few big multinationals like Nutrico, which owns Marine Harvest, a top producer in Scotland. Graham Deer is managing director. Aquaculture as a whole, globally, has enormous potential. 
the stocks in the sea by and large become depleted and I think if people want to eat fish, they're a very, very healthy product. Aquaculture is the way forward. We would feel that the, the salmon that we rear are actually reared in very, very good environmental conditions. They're reared out here in, in the sea, there's very good tidal exchange, the quality of the water is good, the quality of the fish that we produce is good. Now, some people may look at this and say, but it's intensive, but others may look at it and say, no, it's fine. I would say that because I, yes, you I'm a salmon farmer, yeah. but it is the real thing. And you only have to take one of these fish out of the cage and look at it, and you can see that it's the real thing. In terms of quality, it's a very, very high quality product. I would say that farm salmon can generate a much more consistent type of fish than a wild fish. In some nearby rivers, wild fish are consistent only in their absence. They become extinct. But not yet in the Tourneg. Here, a few wild salmon are still breeding. And after spending two or three winters in fresh water, the juveniles, or smolts, show the color change that says they're ready to migrate out to sea. There, they'll remain for at least a year before returning here to spawn. But season after season, fewer salmon reappear. And these two fisheries biologists are trying to find out why. What we're trying to do is monitor a population of wild salmon um, on the west coast of Scotland, which is, has never been done before. Using the trap, what we do is we count how many young salmon, that's to say smolts, go to sea every year. And then how many of them come back again as adult fish. And it'll be very interesting to see this summer how many of those fish that we're actually tagging are coming back. Um, I suspect very, very few. I think it's a great shame because when you look at a smolt going to sea, they are sort of almost miracles of natural engineering. They're, they're built to survive um, and travel thousands of miles. No matter how fantastic nature is at producing this long traveling, long surviving fish, we still seem to be able to cook it up. Each smolt is tagged, identified with a harmless dye, so that if it returns and is recaptured in the trap, there'll be a true record of marine survival. But its chances are not good. Hundreds of departing fish have been tagged here each year, but as few as four returning the following season. Why? And why is this miserable survival rate six times worse here than on the east coast of Scotland? This year on the Tourneg, only 300 smolts set off for the sea, fewer than ever. And for the scientists, the loss is more than statistics. The wild salmon in the rivers have given a lot, um, both in terms of pleasure and recreation, and support to net fisheries, support to hotels. People have really taken for hundreds of years and now these fish are in trouble, you know. So, you know, I think there's a responsibility for people to take the threats that they face now very seriously and to start to do something about it. They will disappear, and that's a fact. Um, and I think that's very, very sad. You sort of feel that they don't have a hope in hell, more or less. Um, <laughs> wish them luck. The very first stage of their saltwater journey takes them out into Loch Yu. As the wild smolts pass the salmon farms and head for open water, they'll pick up currents that will carry them north towards Greenland. This is where the Norwegian fisheries research vessel is waiting for them. On board are government scientists investigating the fate of salmon smolts. Dr. Jens Christian Holst believes that the fish are dying at sea and that the principal killers are parasites known as sea lice. To prove his case, he must first find the salmon and capture them alive and uninjured. To do this, special equipment has been designed, but there's still a measure of luck involved. <laughs> it's a yes. <laughs> this is probably a British postmodes, but this is quite badly affected. I would say that this fish was about to die. Sea lice are parasites that feed on the mucus, skin, and blood of the salmon. 
An adult female louse has trailing egg strings that can produce more than a thousand larvae. The larvae detaches itself and drifts freely on the ocean currents for up to three weeks before it must find a host to feed on and survive. The concentration of these larvae, as Norwegian researchers discovered, is now much greater in the fjords than before the coming of the fish farms. But there was one more vital connection to make. The main question we wanted to really prove was whether wild salmon juveniles died from sea lice in the wild. We caught them very close to the fjord mouth, where the fjord enters the open ocean. It's quite a large fjord with several salmon rivers and also a significant amount of salmon fish farms in the same system. 200 juvenile salmon were caught. Half were given the chemical treatment that rid them of all sea lice. They were then kept in tanks in identical conditions to the remainder of the fish that was still carrying the parasites. Very soon, these fish began to die. Those most heavily infested were the first to go. The fishes in uh, this aquarium, as you can see, are hardly able to swim anymore. And this fish has got the, the so-called, or as we call it, the death crone. The, the death crone is actually a, a wound uh, on the skull. And the uh, sea lice will sit in a circle around this wound, eating the, the skin away from the skull top. And this is the very cer most certain sign of uh, a quick death. In the control tanks, in the absence of sea lice, the salmon remained healthy. What conclusions are drawn from this? Do other studies point a finger of suspicion at sea lice from fish farms? The main point here is that all these different investigations, and they are really uh, quite many at the moment, are showing exactly the same things, the same pattern. And that's uh, why we are claiming or saying very strongly that this is a huge problem. And it's also why we are cooperating with the fish farmers in order to cope with it on a long term. Everywhere in Scotland, salmon and sea trout are in decline for many reasons. That's accepted. But the decline is far greater on the west coast, where fish farms are concentrated, than on the east coast, where there are few. Just as sea lice kill wild fish, they're also a major threat to the aquaculture industry itself and affect most farms. Even if every fish had only one sea louse, a farm like this one at Loch Yu could produce billions of larvae. To kill the parasites, chemical treatments are incorporated into the feed. But sea lice control is never perfect. Within one sea loch, we've got 25 times as many farm salmon as there are wild salmon for the whole west coast of Scotland. Obviously, when you've got so many salmon within one tiny area like this, problems such as disease and parasites tend to proliferate as they would with any sort of livestock. Quite recent research has shown that in the springtime, the sea lice actually boost their production of, of larvae, which then discharge and drift away from the, from the fish farm. And therefore, any wild spots coming out of the rivers have to come through this sort of um, veil of, uh, of parasites in order to get out to the open sea and consequently get infected with high numbers. In Norway, that is accepted fact, and sea lice controls are strictly enforced. Dr. Reid Hola is Norwegian, and he's Director of Technology and Development for Nutrico, the world's leading producer of Atlantic salmon, which owns many of Scotland's fish farms. Yet he denies the farms have contributed to the decline of wild salmon. I don't accept that we make a direct correlation on something where we don't have evidence so far. There is a suspicion, but there is no evidence on, uh, to, to it that that is the case. Is it not a good idea to act on the precautionary principle? Isn't that wise? When an industry is growing, I agree that that, that is the start of it. But uh, I would say that uh, over years, we also need to, to carry out research and objective research to really find out if that is the case or not. Those who feel the case has already been made are upset at this stubborn refusal.